Welcome, everyone, uh, to the next session of Exploration Tech. My name is Adam Trano. Uh, I am the e-commerce growth specialist here at Brilliance, and I can't tell you how excited we are for this conversation because I feel like it really, Laurie, you'll agree with me, it fills a gap that we haven't really filled. We've done probably 50, 60 of these now, and I've been waiting to really talk on the finance piece, and we were just waiting for the right person to come along. So, Joel, yes. thank you for coming into our lives. <laughs> and you know you're gonna unlock and drop some knowledge bombs today so really looking forward to the conversation and i'll pass it to lori yes i am also really excited about the conversation that we're having today a little bit about myself i started brilliance uh, 23 years ago now, uh, in, in 1998, my background's in computer electrical engineering. I went to school at Purdue and ended up through an internship at NASA Johnson Space Center, where I eventually worked as a flight controller for the space shuttle program. It was a really amazing experience. I ended up meeting my husband there, uh, who also was a flight controller at NASA, and he eventually went to work for Rockwell Automation and eventually had a promotion opportunity that brought us to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is where we ended up in 1998. And I was trying to figure out what could be as cool as space. And so I decided to start a web development company. It seemed like a neat place to be. And so between my husband's experience at Rockwell, where he managed their largest data warehouse and my technical background, we found we were a really great fit for working with manufacturers and distributors, helping them to implement digital commerce solutions. So that's how Brilliance got started. And 10 years ago, my husband, Dave, left his job at Rockwell and and now he leads our development team. We've grown to a team of 20, made the Inc. 5000 list last year. And as a part of that growth, being a business owner that kind of started not as a business owner, but as an engineer, there have been a lot of things I've had to learn along the way around finances and what it meant to understand your finances. And so I was super excited uh, this last year when I met Terrell and he's been helping us and really be more strategic about our approach to our finances and just was really excited about the idea of having Terrell join us to talk, especially because of your experience, Terrell, in many manufacturing um, to help us answer these questions that I know um, so many people out there have. So really excited about the conversation today. Terrell, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Yeah, I mean, how can I top that? That is an amazing <laughs> story. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm Terrell Turner. Um, my, my background is probably started like most, uh, most accountants. I went to undergrad, went to graduate school, got a master's degree in accounting, went the public accounting route and really audited a lot of different companies. But one of the things I, I always wanted to do instead of just being an auditor or coming in telling you, hey, this is what you're doing wrong. But it's like, how do I actually help them fix those things and actually make, you know, make sense of the numbers? Because all I was talking to were other accountants. So I left that and went into working for an industrial manufacturing company. The headquarters was out of the suburbs of Chicago. And so I worked in one of their plants and that's where I learned of working with a ton of process engineers, mechanical engineers, working with the supply chain of really understanding how operations really work and took several promotions and worked in the engineering team. And then I moved down to Brazil to work um, in their division in South America. So again, working across the engineers, the operations, supply chain, and came back to the US and, and worked with their sales operation to get a more full view. I also worked in uh, their investor relations. So it was a Fortune 500 company. So on the phone a lot with Wall Street analysts and trying to translate what was going on in the company, how do I explain it in a way that they would understand it? Yeah. And then after that, I took a job with General Electric and again, did several finance leadership roles in several of their operations of working on uh, jet engines and learning that world and just the business side. And um, after that, after doing that for a few years, my wife and I moved to the Carolinas. Uh, we wanted to be closer to family and I took a finance leadership role with a tech company. So really learning finance and operations and how do we connect the dots in that world. And after doing that for some time, I said, you know, I, I really want to take all that I've learned and launch my own firm to really help amazing businesses like you guys and helping you navigate all those things that I was helping these Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies do. It's just yeah. like no one's really helping the small to medium sized businesses with the same type of knowledge. And so that's what I do is like, you know, really bridging that gap between finance and how do we make sense of it from engineering to operations to sales to marketing 
to really get you a full financial picture of what's going on in your business. Perfect. Uh, I am so excited. You guys have incredible histories and I can't wait. When companies are investing in new initiatives, how would you recommend business leaders think through their ROI? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that a lot of times, you know, when people hear RRI, they're just immediately thinking, hey, what's the profit that's going to come back? And which that is a part of it. And I do think that you should be asking yourself, if we're going to spend this amount of money, what is this going to help us do? Like, is it going to help us become more efficient? So that means we're going to cut costs and or save on inefficient things that we're doing or is this going to help us produce more revenue meaning we're going to be able to grow the top line of the business and then another thing that i always tell people you also want to think about is the cash flow impact because you can invest in some great projects in your business but the question you also want to ask yourself is how long is it going to take you to start seeing those benefits and i'll give you know like a, a everyday example like i was talking to a, a plumber that's doing some construction at my house and they were like, hey, this new thing is going to pay for it. Well, they tell you it's going to pay for itself. I'm like, OK, that sounds good. But how long does it take for that to happen? They're like, like 25 years. Like, <laughs> 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 that kind of changes the scenario when you kind of understand the timeline. So right. I tell people is, you know, is this going to cut costs? Is it going to increase revenue? And then also making sure you understand how long is it going to take for me to actually start seeing those benefits? What do you do in that situation when you're really trying to flip the script on how the company is viewing it? And, you know, sometimes they're they're waiting a long extended period of time. To, to get the cash in from selling their products because maybe they have extended terms with their customers. How does that kind of factor in? How do they negotiate those terms, et cetera? Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, this is definitely an area where I learned it from spending a lot of time around engineers. And when spending so much time around them and they would walk me through like their simulations and, you know, the, the, the basis of a simulation is let me you know, in a controlled environment, create what the situation would look like and show you, hey, if this factor changes, this is what happens. And so I started taking that same mindset in how we do financial modeling. So I'm like, okay, all right, let me just create a simulated financial picture of what's going to happen. If your payment terms are here, here's what that's going to look like. And I think when people start to see that and they start to connect the dots of like, oh, this is what the impact of my decision is going to be. It really helps them start to think differently. And then we can take a step back and say, all right, we probably have a couple of trade offs. I mean, when it comes down to long paybacks, either we can give some type of discount up front, which means you might make a less profit, but it may bring the cash flow in line with what you need it to be. Or, you know, you may be in a scenario where you're like, well, we can wait a little bit longer to get the cash. In that case, it's like, okay, all right, if you're going to give longer payment terms, maybe we take the price a little bit higher to compensate us for that. And part of that comes with just being able to have some way to simulate in a controlled environment what the outcome would look like if you change this factor or if you change that factor. And as people get used to seeing that, it helps them to start you know what? Hey, there are some trade-offs. There are some opportunities because some businesses look at it and say, well, our payment terms are what they are. And it's like, well, there probably is some flexibility. You just yeah. don't know which levers to pull to actually adjust things. Yeah. It's one of the things, Terrell, I've really valued in, in your work for us is that, you know, you helped us to create a financial model that looks at different drivers and how it impacts our cash and profit. And the reality is like being able to like run different scenarios, um, it helps to make better decisions. And to your point, like it helps us to ask better questions or, or think more creatively about how we might approach a situation to be more win-win for us and for our clients. So yeah, really insightful. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because I tell people all the time, I mean, whatever business, uh, you know, situation or business transaction that you're going into is 
it's probably more flexible than you realize. Um, I mean, when you really think about it from what does the other person want? What do you want? And hey, here are the, the levers that I can negotiate on. So I always tell people is let's take a step back and let's really look at it and see, okay, all right, the person that you're either buying from or selling to, they probably have some, you know, some wiggle room on certain factors. You just got to figure out what that is and then actually just go through that negotiation or that discussion process to figure that out because, you know, you could be passing up a great opportunity because you just think that, hey, this is the deal. It is what it is. Nothing can change. But I'm like, most of the time, that's not the case. So we work with a lot of manufacturers who are considering a digital transformation. Oftentimes I know when, when organizations are looking at digital transformation, or at least when they're looking at digital commerce, they're thinking about their ROI in terms of revenue growth, which is great. And, and organizations see revenue growth, but I'm curious, like, do you, do you think that efficiencies gain should be a part of what they're, how they're calculating their ROI analysis? And how do you think that factors in? I definitely think that it should be. I mean, I will say is before I actually was in the role of like doing finance leadership and had to go through a transformation, you know, I looked at it probably like most business people look at it is, okay, just look at the numbers. Okay. Is our revenue going to go up? Is our cost going to, but one of those factors that I learned as a leader is just the, the stress level on the people. When you start to implement efficiencies, it definitely does take stress off of your people. And that cannot be underestimated. And I know it's, that's one's a little more challenging to put a numerical number on it, but yeah. it is a factor that, you know, that business leaders should keep in mind. It's, you know, you know, this one person that's doing this mundane task over and over and over again, eventually it wears them down and they could be doing something else more valuable with their time. Or they could just be feeling better about their job if they didn't have to keep doing this same task day in and day out. So I do think efficiency should be in the equation. I mean, one way to look at efficiency is how much, you know, how much money is this going to save us if we're not spending, you know, time doing this? You know, if we implement this technology, you know, is it going to save us an hour, two hours, three hours? And when you think about a team of people saving one to two hours per task, it adds up in a huge yeah. way. And then I think the other other side of that is just being able to say, OK, all right, now that we have that hour to two hours back, what else could they be doing? And a lot of times there are things that could be there are things that your team could be doing to help the business grow even faster. To yeah. where now you get, you know, two benefits. Just you're not spending time doing that, so you're saving costs there. But now you're redeploying those resources to do something else more valuable, which means they're creating even more growth for the business and even more profitability. So I definitely think efficiency should completely be in the scenario. Definitely. Yeah, I think about one of our uh, customers who told us, a manufacturer who was saying that because of digital commerce, their salespeople were no longer spending time taking the $50 part order and they could spend time selling the $50,000 solution, changing it so they no longer have to spend time on some activities to be more value add, higher value add. So Terrell, you mentioned like you've got a lot of experience working in manufacturing and and I'm curious what advice you would give to teams that are looking to be more effective in realizing benefit from digital projects. I know you've been through several. Yeah, I think the first one and I kind of learned this the hard way. I won't say the name <laughs> of the company that I was at when and I did it, but I'll, I'll explain the situation. But first, I, here here's the punchline. Don't be ashamed or don't be too prideful to actually get help. I was brought in because I had gone through an ERP implementation before. And so I'm like, okay, I've done this before. And so I was brought in when they were probably like eight months into the process. And so I sat in a couple of the meetings and there were questions that I asked about them like, well, what about this? And what about this? And, and you know, how is this gonna communicate? And what we ran into a situation was they had spent eight months building up, you know, the back end of the system and they had left off some very critical pieces. So 
this eight months worth of work and you know thousands and thousands of dollars later we're like we can't move forward with this project because we miss this and i was like well if we had someone who actually understood this come in the beginning we could have avoided this i mean because yeah. what i always tell people is that you know when it comes down to you know it solution implementations I understand that companies have an internal IT department, but that internal IT department isn't like constantly going through implementations. They aren't constantly going through transformation. So it's not second nature to them. And it's very common that they miss things. So when it comes down to working with a company that, if that is what that company does, like this company implements these type of ERPs or this company implements this type of software, it's just like, they're probably going to notice things that the internal IT team didn't or just any of the internal team members didn't because you know that really does save you a lot of issues in the long run and i've even had some situations where you know the company was able to get the system implemented but let's say a year into it they wanted to activate a certain feature but they weren't able to because during their initial implementation they customize something that they didn't understand what impact that would have down the line. And yeah. now when we need that feature to work, you know, they're on the phone yelling with the vendor saying, well, you promised us this feature, it doesn't work. <laughs> and the vendor's like, well, you customize this, which messed up that, and it just wasn't a good relationship. Yeah. And so, I mean, hiring help that knows how to do these implementations, I would say, that would be my number one piece of advice is get help that actually understands it because it will save you so much headache. That's awesome. Yeah, that, uh, we hear and see that a lot. So <laughs> love, love your perspective on that. Now, do you think it's their ego about their internal team that's kind of getting in the way? You know, are there questions that organizations kind of ask themselves you know, to kind of spot check themselves and be like, is this something we should tackle? Should we go out for outside help? Like, what can they do when they're meeting with their internal team to be like, yes, we should go get help? Yeah, I think it's a combination of ego and ignorance. Ego from the standpoint that, you know, if your leadership team comes down and says, hey, this is the path we need to do, no one wants to raise their hand and say, well, we don't have the capability to do it. Like, no one wants to just be upfront and volunteer that. Although it may be very true that they don't have the capability, unfortunately, the culture of most environments are not conducive to that. It's just like, hey, the people who usually get the promotions are the ones who have the can-do attitude. So I do think some of it is a little bit of ego. And then some of it, I think, is just ignorance. Because, I mean, when you think about your average professional in any manufacturing or any type of you know, large organization, if you think about it, like, how often do they really go through system implementations maybe once a career maybe twice for some people <laughs> because some of the bigger you know manufacturing companies they still had the system that they were using in the 80s so everyone who had worked there from the 80s till then they had never implemented a system so when it was time to implement a new system all of those people who they knew their process but they had never seen a system implementation so they had no idea how to actually guide that process and so i think for leaders it's just being honest enough to say all right when is the last time we've actually changed our system and do we really have the right resources on the team because that is a very honest question you have to ask yourself and i don't think a lot of businesses are asking themselves that that question because they're looking at it from hey if we do this internally we'll save money but i always say oh, what happens if you get this wrong? Like how yeah. much is it gonna cost you to fix this if we get this wrong? And what's the likelihood of us getting it wrong? And for most people, like I said, they've never actually gone through a system implementation or they've never had to be in a direct role when it comes to a system implementation because being hands-on and seeing it at a distance are two completely different things. <laughs> and so, <Yeah. laughs> so you really, like I said, I, I always tell them that, you know, just ask yourself, do you really have the experience on your team to guide you through this? And yes, you'll save money by using internal teams, but 
what is it going to cost you if you get this wrong? Like, um, and I've seen horror stories of companies not being able to ship products to their customers or them not being able to place orders to their vendors. And it's like, that is a huge hit to your business if you get that wrong. And I'm like, you probably should have just paid the, you know, pay the money to bring in a specialist or to bring in another outside company to help guide you through this so you wouldn't have that issue. Yeah. Yeah. We always, we've seen it too. And we, you know, we often say to people, you know, what's the cost of doing it twice, right? You know, like if you, <laughs> to your point, like if you get it wrong and you have to restart again, um, yeah, that, that's an expensive proposition. Re really good points. We talk to a lot of B2B organizations who have a lot of engineers on staff, especially in the manufacturing world. That's a big component of the business. And they inherently believe that what they do is too technical to put online or, or be digital. And um, combining component parts to complete finish assembly. With your experience with engineers, like what have you kind of seen them go through as a process of like, hey, maybe we actually do have a finished product we can put online for our, our customers to buy. Or, you know, if, if it's just the component parts that they're designing and putting on that are more custom, um, what's your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, that is a very common thing because I do think engineers take a lot of pride in the work that they do. And they should because, I mean, a, a lot of the things that engineers have come up with, it's, it actually keeps us alive. I mean, I learned that from working with, you know, um, aerospace engineers. Like if they didn't get that right, there would be a lot of problems. So they should take a lot of pride in what they do. Now, when it comes down to, you know, processes of implementing, you know, tools and technology to, they do a lot of times say, well, this is too custom. So one of the approaches that, that I've definitely taken is, you know, finding inexpensive ways to create some type of simulation of what they're, they're doing. So, because I always say that, you know, for you to figure it out as an engineer, you have to understand the math and whatever principles that you're leveraging to do whatever it is that you're doing. So there's some type of formula in their head that, that backs up what they're doing. So I would say, okay, all right, let me take just a small piece of that and let me try to create a, a, a model of it in Excel. And I'm like, if I can create the shell of a model in Excel, if we talk to someone who really knows development and IT, they probably can create an even more extensive model because most of the time, I think what a lot of engineers aren't as aware of is, you know, some of the software solutions that do have a lot more levers or I guess you ha have more conditional variables. And that's what I found is that the conditional variables is what the engineers had a lack of confidence in the system being able to do. But when you can start to show them that, hey, we can build in conditional variables. When I started doing that on a very simple view in Excel, what they started getting a little bit more confidence in saying, okay, all right, we'll take this piece of the process, we'll do that in the system. And when they see that that actually works, then they're like, well, how about this? And then that's where I think it really gets into from a leadership standpoint. But for me, it was asking, well, if you didn't have to do this anymore, what else could you be doing? And then that's when they really start getting excited. Like, okay, all right, how much stuff can I give you now? <laughs> yeah. Just start driving it. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Yes, I love it. And to your point, definitely once, like if you handled an Excel sheet to like to our team, then we would we would understand, we'd know how to quote it. We'd know what, you know, how to take it to the next step from a digital perspective. Mm -hmm. So yeah. great advice. Terrell, so you've worked in really large organizations. I know you work with smaller teams today, like supporting them. But what's What would be your advice in terms of how uh, smaller mid-market companies could be, what can they be doing to better compete with larger organizations? Yeah, one of the first things I would tell, you know, smaller to, to mid-market size companies is, you know, it may seem intimidating when you're going against the big players, but having been in the boardroom with some of those big player discussions with the CEOs and, and, and the CEO's team, one of the things that, that, was talk, that we used to talk about in those rooms was, 
hey, how do we start to think like the smaller, medium-sized players? Because there's a whole lot of layers of bureaucracy and opinions that get embedded in with larger organizations that they're not able to pivot as fast. So like one of the large organizations that I was with, I remember sitting with the CEO and we were talking with the leadership team and he was explaining, he was like, okay guys, we need to figure this out because there are some deals that we were planning on doing with, you know, with some large customers of ours, but we're losing part of the business because we can't respond fast enough. And everyone was like, oh, okay, we must be losing to, and they started naming the other competitors who were the same size as us. And then CEO was like, no, here's who we lost the last four deals to. And he started reading the names off and people are like, who are they? He was like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> he was like, We're losing to smaller players because they can actually respond to the needs of the client faster than we can. And he was like, and you've never heard of these companies before. <laughs> but he was like, you know, so if we don't learn how to think smaller, we're going to keep losing. So I always tell, you know, small to medium sized businesses is don't be intimidated by the size of the larger companies, because in some respects, they're trying to actually get closer to how you can operate than you think. The other thing I would say is, is don't be afraid to pick your niche. I mean, what is it that you do well and do realize that you can build a very, very successful business off of what you do well? Because what I have seen with a lot of smaller businesses where they they try to diversify so much that they, you know, they kind of lose their identity of what they're good at. And they're stretching themselves because they're like, well, this could be, you know, something that helps us make more money or this can help us make more money. But I'm like, if it distracts you from what you're good at, eventually you're going to start losing customers in your core business and you're going to be scrambling, trying to pick up these odds and end jobs. And it's just like, it doesn't make sense to go buy another business or to pick up a customer that is outside of, you know, what you do at your core and then it distracts you. So understanding that if you've picked a good niche, you can build a successful business in your niche and it's okay to focus on that. And I think the the other thing is, is just, I would say, is, is really realizing that speed becomes your advantage. I mean, mm -hmm. as a smaller to medium-sized company, speed is your advantage, and it allows you to be able to respond to the customers faster, and it allows you to be able to adjust quicker because at the end of the day, the company that responds to the customer's needs the you know the fastest the most efficient the most effective that's usually going to be the company that wins whether that's a small company or a large company if you can respond to the needs of the customer like that's your that's your winning strategy right there that's awesome Definitely. that's yeah. makes me think of the what's the old saying like stepping over dollars to pick up pennies if the you know <laughs> as far as small organizations you know just follow your identity and and do really well what you're you know known for and what your core business is around so i know we're running short on time but terrell i'm gonna put you on the spot because i think we should slide in this one last question <laughs> typically you know we think of people that work in finance you know as typically controlling costs and you know are therefore poten potentially getting in the way of kind of the digital innovation you know, I would love you to set the record straight for all the finance people out there. Um, how can they actually support the digital innovation? Because I think, you know, you have a really good perspective on how companies should take advantage of that. Okay. All right. So I will say, um, I'm guessing that the person who asked this question is probably not a finance person. So I would say, here's my gift to you. And you can tell them Terrell Turner said it. Um, so. <laughs> You can go back to your finance team. And I think even just really understanding that the real goal of finance is, is not necessarily to control costs. The real goal of finance is really to understand, you know, all of the, the situations or the strategy of the business and to inform you on here's what the cost, here's what the benefits are. Now, my job is to help you see what the picture looks like. Now, at the same time, I think some some finance professionals 
get more in the controlling costs because that's what they get praised for. But I think at the end of the day, what their job really is, is my job is to show you what the picture looks like and then also make recommendations on, hey, here are some of the levers that we can probably pull. If you don't like the picture, here's what we can do to kind of change it or adjust it. Um, and it's better if I tell you that beforehand. And so, you know, it, I even think about like when Lori and I were talking and we were working on, you know, the, the financial models. And one of the things, the approaches that I took was, okay, all right, you tell me what you want to do. I'll draw the financial picture for you. And then we'll see, do you like that picture? If you don't like that picture, here are the things we probably need to do to change that, to stop that from happening. And I think that when finance professionals take that perspective, my job is to draw the financial picture for you, almost like a, a, a sketch artist. Like, you know, if, if, you, if you've ever seen like a sketch artist that's like, you know, at one of the carnivals or whatever, you sit down, they draw the picture. And it's just like, my job is just to draw the picture of what you just explained to me. And if you don't like it, then we can work together and I can start telling you, well, if you want to change this, hey, here are some levers we should probably pull on. And I think that as you, as finance people take that perspective is, my job is, like I said, to help draw the picture of what we think is gonna be, and then let's work together to figure out how do we move things around or adjust things so that we can get a better end result. When that becomes the relationship, I do think the dynamic between you know, finance and the rest of the business becomes less contentious. Be yeah. now, now it does take a two part, you know, a two part relationship because that also means for the non-finance teams have to be a little bit more transparent about, hey, this is what we're thinking, as opposed to saying, hey, this is what we did last week. <laughs> it's just like you got to yeah. be able to communicate beforehand if you want the finance team to be able to help, you know, with that future potential future state view. Awesome. Yeah, but much more collaborative. It's great advice. Uh, yeah. Oh. That is all the time we have. But before we leave, please tell us about the awesome work you do with the TL Turner Group and then also how our guests can get uh, in contact with you. Absolutely. Yeah. So the TL Turner Group, I mean, we're a accounting and CFO firm and we focus on helping our clients from the, the bookkeeping aspects to uh, and also financial analysis, kind of building models, doing due diligence and kind of that forward looking strategy. Because one of the things we realize is that a lot of people, what they get from their accounting function or their bookkeeping is, you know, they get a report, but it doesn't really give them insights on what should we do next. So that's where our CFO services come into play of really helping build out models and helping make the financial information useful for decisions. And so one of the big things that we do a lot of is we create a ton of free content through our media company called the Business Talk Library. And there you can go to thebusinesstalklibrary.com to where you can see, like I said, the 300 plus episodes of our shows that we've done, where we're talking about so many different things that we've kind of learned from our experiences, from working with other businesses and we're putting it out there for people to be able to go back and use it in their own business. And there we also have some buttons there where you can ask us a question, you can get in touch with us. So the Business Talk Library is probably the best place that I tell people to start because you're gonna see tons of free stuff and ways to get in touch with us. I so appreciate you joining us today, Terrell. This information has been fabulous and uh, yeah, just really excited um, and, and, and so impressed with all the content that you're creating, really, really great resources. So make sure our audience should definitely check out businesstalklibrary.com. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you for having me. Yeah. Pleasure.